Next up, we got Aaron, who's who's concerned about um, our sanity apparently, and is going to talk about uh, pipelines. He's a uh, application security manager for Pearson, mm -hmm. so he has uh, has some experience. And by the fact that he's standing here, still has sanity left. So that's right. Please explain how. All right, thank you. All right, so today I'm going to talk about. It's more of a case study. It's about how we did our application security program and how we're iterating through it. Um, the things that we found that worked and the things that we found that didn't work. So one of the first things I'm going to talk about is fast food, which might be a little odd. Um, but I found it interesting, and, and I'm not a, f a huge fan of fast food, but it, it's there, and you usually get the same sort of quality. We, we can debate about the quality of it. But 189 seconds is the average time in a drive through with McDonald's. And I saw that you have the golden arches over here, so awesome, right? Uh, so so there's, always, there's a certain period of time that will get you through that drive through and it's, and it's very predictable for the most part. Just jumping. All right. And as you can see here, they, there's very many like stations set up, right? You've got certain people that are doing things. They're very attentive to you, and they're taking you through the process of getting here. You're getting a burrito, I think, and getting you through to the end, right? So there's a very set set of things that have to happen. All right, I think you can see the correlation here. And the other thing they do is instrumentation, which I thought was really kind of cool. They've got a, in the back room, they've got a whole set of sensors and things like that. And they're ch ch checking all sorts of things. Like the one thing they're checking is how long did it take for you to drive up to the gate? How long did it take you to, to get the money? How long did it take you to order? And, and then by the time you get there, the food's already ready for you. So just a quick question to see if you know, what is the part that takes the most time in a drive through Which part of the process takes the most time? Yeah, exactly. Payment is the, is, the, is the exact sticking point. And that's the point where they're trying to speed up that, that process. So what I found was interesting was is a Big Mac is a Big Mac really wherever you go. It tastes the same wherever it is, for the most part. If you're in the US, it tastes the same. I just think if you're in India, it has its own special flavor. But, or, or any other country, it has its own unique taste. But it really always tastes the same. So you're getting that same product no matter what. Another one that I thought was interesting, and I got these from uh, an actual fast food, like there's a you know, consortium of fast food, who knew, right? You know, they meet together just like AppSec EU, they've got fast food EU, maybe. Uh, so they have different work cells, right, with an individual re uh, a restaurant combined to make a certain product, right? Um, and then they're flexible, right? Each person specializes within a role. It sounds a little bit like security, right? We, we all have our different expertise. Um, and then it's very lean, right? I mean, you never see a huge fast food kitchen. They're very, very small. And just like security, we have very, very small resources. But our output is tremendous. Should be tremendous. <laughs> and then I thought, well, what would it look like if AppSec ran fast food? Would, would we be spilling things? Would it be kind of like, well, I want to get a hamburger. Yeah, that's going to take you, I don't know, two minutes. It could take you 10 minutes. It could take an hour. Who knows? That's how I kind of feel like when our customers come to us and say, hey, I want an assessment from you. And you're like, well, eh, it, might take, it might take a minute. It might take two hours. It might take two days. We're not quite sure. So where I want to get to is, can I be more predictable about when I give you back something? And in, in, in application security, or just in security in general, we're very good at um, throwing stones at other people, saying, oh, you know, you, you guys can't code. You guys can't do this. You guys can't do that. But then what, what, do we, what does our output look like back to our customers? You know, it, do we give back that same sort of quality that we expect from our developers when they're coding to code securely? So Matt talked about this pipeline the other day. Um, just go through it here. Right at the very beginning here, we have our, our security services request. We have our bag of holding, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And then we have our orchestration. And then we have our suite of tools. Now, we don't use all of these tools, but I just threw them in there as a case of, hey, there's a lots of different tools that we can put in here. And then we, we aggregate them with ThreadFix. And then we put them out to our uh, bug management systems like JIRA. So that, that's our tools, tooling suite. Now, if you think about it, what does, what does your front door look like? So when, it, when it, your customer comes to you, um, most of us are internal, right? So when our lines of business come to us, what does it look like? How, how do we take our order? You know, is it number one, number two, number three? What do those things look like? So what, can I get a number one, which would be maybe an assessment, a dynamic assessment, or a static? 
do we make it easy for them? So whether you have a service now queue or something like that, or is it just an email you fire off, and then at some point somebody will get back to you and say, hey, here's, here's what happens, here's what you need to do, here's your ticket number, what, what does that look like? So for us, and this is what it used to look like, is we had a uh, Google form. And we would offer, hey, if you want this, that, uh, here's the set of services that we'll give for you, and here's when you kind of sh should expect us to get a result. And, and, and we're working on now, in, in our next version that we're going to be coming out with, um, that will totally integrate into our product that we're talking about here that we built. So let me talk a little bit about minimal viable product, right? MVP. Are you all familiar with that term, right? So if you're agile and you want to get a product, you're lean, you want to get a product out the door really quickly, and you're only going to do a very small subsection of that product, just the very minimal thing that will actually let it work. So what we did was, as we said, well, we need to do, we've got a couple of use cases here. We need to um, know our application inventory, right? We need to know a lot of metadata about the application. Because when you come to me and say, well, hey, scan my app, we're like, well, what's your app? And then we have to go through, well, does this have, what sort of compliance does it need? There's a whole lot of metadata that you need to know about an application in order to assess it correctly. And so we needed to have a place for that. And so where did we used to have that? Excel, a spreadsheet. And I don't know about you, but I've been talking about spreadsheets for a long, long time, and I get tired of being in spreadsheets. So I want to get out of those spreadsheets. And besides that, it's just not indexable. So for a while there, I had a SharePoint site. And I'm sure maybe the rest of you can say, share stories too. Yeah, we use this, we use that. And you know, to, to some degree, it was successful or not successful. So we took what we learned. Um, we took what we learned at Rackspace, and we said, all right, what would we do to design a, an app that could manage our entire pro production process? So when we first came out with our product that we were going to show you, um, it, it didn't do very much. It was simply an application listing, and then you can tie an engagement and an assessment to that. And that was all it did. I mean, it, it was very rudimentary. But within three months, uh, we dedicated one person on our team, Adam, and Adam did a great job. He focused on um, getting this product out. So before we did that, though, we pulled our team and we said, hey, what do you guys, what, what are you guys proficient in? So we're, we're application security people. We're not developers per se, but, you know, we can hack something out there if we need to. So, you know, we said, well, we, we gave them some choices. We're like, all right, well, no JS, right, because all the cool kids are doing it. We realized really quickly that we're not hipsters. So then, then, we, then we went to, uh, so we looked at Python. And uh, what were some of the other choices? We didn't do Perl because we we're just not Perl. <laughs> I said Go. That's good. Yeah, Go. But then there, there wasn't a good web framework for that. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we came out with Python because a lot of Python is fairly, you know, we all knew Python. We all knew Django. Um, I'm, you know, I'm really kind of agnostic to whatever we do, whatever you choose. But just choose something that your team is familiar with. We didn't want to do something compiled because we wanted to be able to edit it on the fly. It should be something that's easy. We don't have to set up an editor or those kinds of things or a, a source. So we, we, uh, one of the guys on our team, Adam, he came up with a name. He said, I'm going to call it Bag of Holding because it's going to hold all of our things. Uh, and then we affectionately call it uh, Bo. So in, in Mass Talk, he kept talking about Bo, and so Bo is Bag of Holding. So real quick here, what, is, uh, what does Bo do? Well, the question is, what doesn't Bo do? This would be the better question, really. Uh, but anyway, what it does is it helps us manage our application security program. And it helps us have an application repository. Now, I don't know about your company, but it seems like a lot of companies struggle with keeping a, a clear view of all the applications that they have. So, so at Pearson, we have hundreds of applications. Some would say thousands plus of applications. But I, I go to find a complete repository, uh, app owners, all those different types of things, and I can't find it. Uh, I struggle. So I think a lot of companies kind of struggle with their, their inventory and keeping it up to date. Um, so our, our idea was, well, we're just going to create our own inventory, and we're going to have a listing of the applications, and we're going to keep up that metadata. But I'll talk a bit about it later, is we're going to have actually a way to actually update that. So if you do have an application repository that is kept up, we can pull that in as a feed. So, and I'll show you how that's done. Uh, then we wanted to keep engagements tracking, right? So people come to you and say, I get this all the time, right? Hey, application um, learning system, right? When was the last time you assessed it? 
what did you find was the problem with that? And what were the associated activities that you did to it? So you say you did a manual assessment. You said you did a code review. Can you prove to me that you did those types of things? It also works well, well as an auditor be gone tool, right? Because auditors love to ask you those kinds of questions, and they want you to provide supporting evidence for that. And so that's what this is going to help us do. Also, report repository. Um, and then comments, right? We want to have comments from the team. Our team is very, very distributed across the globe. In fact, we're not in the same offices. So being able to communicate is really, really huge. And being able to know really, really quickly. So when I get a call, somebody says, hey, what about this app? Boom. Here it is. Here's the report. And there it is. Or I can say, you know what? I've never heard of your app. So let's get it through the process. And then I just say, here, I shoot them a link and say, here, fill this out. And we'll, we'll, we'll engage with you. Uh, data classification, PII, right? All those things. And then going back to the, the, the fast food sort of thing is, how long does it take you on average to do a manual assessment? So what's the rule of thumb? How, how long does it, just to get some numbers here, manual assessments, how long does it take you? A week? A week, OK. Yeah, we, we've all got a feeling, right? It takes a certain four weeks for, for very comprehensive, right? To do it properly. Yeah. I'd agree. So, we, and we would like to know in the past, well, how long does it actually take us? And then here's the one that's big for us is um, sharing credentials. So you've got to do an assessment. And where do you put those credentials? Well, a lot of times it's just emailed to us, test credentials, those kinds of things. So that's where, the other place we're going to store. And then environment details. So instead of showing you screenshots, I'm going to just jump to the application. And I don't think it's that one. Here. Now the goal, the, the goal of what I'm going to show you here is that your team, we're, we're gonna, we're, I'm, I'm in the end stages right now of actually getting this open sourced. So we're going to be pushing this out there. But the, the other goal of it too is, is your company might not work like ours. In fact, I'm sure it doesn't. You know, you've got nuances in your own company. So the idea here is you can use what we have or you know, to, to motivate you to create your own, right? So w one of the things that we struggled with is I'd go to ask a vendor and say, hey, vendor, can you do this for us? And they go, well, that's a nice feature. We'll think about it, and we'll get back to you. And a year later, you ask them, well, did you, do, did you want to do it? And they say, no, it just didn't fit into our, you know, our roadmap. And you're like, well, that's nice, but now look at now we don't have that cool thing that we wanted. And so this really puts us back into the driver's seat, and, and we're able to actually control uh, what we can do. So just for an example here, here's an application. You know, I, I decided to throw WebGoat in here because, right, we've probably all used WebGoat before. So we have an example here of, you know, here's what WebGoat does. Uh, we have this idea of service level agreements or tiering. So an application that is not important or maybe is internal only or maybe you, you deem it as not as critical would be uh, you know, a, tier, a lower tier versus a tier, higher tier application, which is on the internet, it's accessible, it has all your PII, would be higher. And then there would be more security activities that should happen to that application. That was the idea there. Uh, we, then, we then keep you know, basic uh, metadata information. So because, so we know it's MySQL, we know it's Java, and because we know that um, WebGoat has a lot of vulnerabilities, we put Akamai in front of it with Kona. Just kidding, but anyway. Um, and then we've got some regulations here. Uh, we decided that, you know, maybe we have PCI, whatever it is, um, and then we can look at all the uh, different metadata that's associated with it. Uh, the last one is we can tag it. So, you know, you can tag different applications together. So for, for a lot of our teams, um, disparate business units, you know, certain, p certain program managers have different pr uh, product portfolios with them. So we're able to tag it any which way we want, and then we can push out reporting to them. So uh, the idea is of an engagement, right? Um, you can see here we have a pending engagement, right? and, and we can see all the activities that are associated with that. So we have an IBM app scan that's going to happen, a manual assessment, reporting, and peer review. The nice thing about it is, is it, is it helps you, um, if your team is spread out, you can, you can focus them on specific things. You can have the people that just do uh, uh, scanning, right? And maybe they're not a senior level resource. In fact, they probably aren't. 
So you can, have, you can have all the things set up for you so that your senior level assessor doesn't have to do like all the boring work. So by the time it gets to him, so you could have IBM app scan set up already done. He could have that report already attached. You could already do the static that could already be attached. You would already have their credentials. And so then they're focusing just solely on the manual assessment, which saves a lot of time. And it also focuses, like, who here likes to do reporting? In fact, I was just another uh, one. Nobody likes to do reporting. We, we all hate it. You like reporting? No. Yeah? Yeah, so, so it really allows us to do that. And then we do peer review, right? So we can have that quality. And our goal, right, is to have zero false positives. I mean, we don't want to waste time and give somebody a false positive. All right. Just go through a couple other screens here. So we have our environment details, right? And then, you know, unfortunately, we're not allowed to always do things in production. So, so you can you can say where where you have things approved for production versus not production, and then uh, obviously the different roles that are associated with it. And and what's nice about this is if somebody's on leave or they're out, um, another person can pick it up right where they left off. Well, we, we don't do that, but there's no reason why you couldn't do that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and then we have uh, related people. So, you know, maybe you have a security champion within your um, program. Uh, maybe you have the product owner. Uh, maybe you have somebody that you need to contact in case of emergency. There's always, there's, there's owners and people associated with applications. This is where we keep it. Um, and then we have, obviously, all the settings for it and all the metadata and, I could, you know, all that. Uh, the other nice thing that I just want to show real quick here, let me go into a, one of these. Uh, so, for example, uh, is, is the commenting ability, um, and it's all in Markdown. So, it, it also, you can actually use code as well. So, you can actually post blocks of code in there and, and get commenting back on that. <coughs> uh, we then have a dashboard. So, when you log in, you can see, okay, here's the things that are assigned to me, and here's the things that are due. And then for me, uh, what's extremely important, and I go here quite a bit, is so I know what we're all working on, and I know exactly who's working on what. Super important for managing your application security team and program is to know. And then you can sort of see, OK, well, you know what? You want me to work on this? Well, OK, but look at all the other things that we're going to have to push aside if we do that. So it helps as a planning tool. And we're starting now to actually push more and more in there so that we have a schedule set up on here's for the next year is what it's going to look like for our, for our manual assessments. And you get an idea of you know, resourcing really, really quickly. It'll help you with your resourcing. And so that, that's, really the, that's really the heart of it. And then obviously you can search by application and all of our application information is in there. Um, and you can filter on any of that. So that's what we did in, what would you say, Matt? Was that like three months? Yeah, about three months, just one person working on it. So I think, you know, it's a pretty good, um, and, and, it, and it's really helped us. So let me just talk about the next part of this. Skip right here. So going to the length of activities, right, what this is going to help us is um, specifying how much time that we can spend on that. Here we go. Slide. There it is. And it comes. So we then get an idea here of how long it takes us for each application, right? So static code is going to take us this long, manual assessment is going to take us that long, uh, and ASVS will take us that, that long. One of the uh, other th pieces that we're going to add into it is the ASVS. So you'll be able to tie an ASVS to an application. And then Matt and I were talking about this yesterday. There's no reason why you couldn't tie OpenSAM to it. Because it's really the same sort of concept. It's just that it's more now at the uh, higher level versus the ASVS being at the, the lower level. So now you can start giving a benchmark and you can it, taking it out of those Excel spreadsheets. So you can just tell your developer, hey, here's your application. Here's all the vulnerabilities. And by the way, you're at level one, two, or three on your ASVS. It's really pretty cool. All right, um, here's some other ideas that we have for uh, bag of holding. Uh, you know, last night, a lot of people are talking. 
Who doesn't like to tell a story about, well, I was at this assessment, and I found this certain vulnerability, and it was really weird the way I was able to get in. I used this UDP attack, and then whatever, whatever, right? Who doesn't like to tell those stories, right? We, we all like to tell the stories about how we were able to get into an application. So uh, one of the things we were think I was thinking about is, could we turn it into sort of like a social feed kind of thing? And I know, you know, as security professionals kind of laugh at, well, Facebook, we want Facebook for vulnerabilities? <laughs> Actually, I do, right? I want to shine a light on those vulnerabilities because it also helps everybody else learn in your team, right? Because if I tell you about how, that, how you did that vulnerability, you're going to go, wow, that's really awesome. I was just on using this other application. I wonder if that would work on that application. And so you can kind of um, really grow your, your knowledge organically rather than having like some boring static, you know, site that you go to look at. Well, go to the, not picking on cheat sheets, but, you know, go over there to figure out how to do that sort of thing. You kind of build it up internally. Um, I don't have this feature yet, so this is just a wish list. Well, the other thing, too, is it lets you do mentoring at a distance, because we're all over the place. Like, our team is very geographic first. So yeah. I can help the guy who's on the other side of the globe whenever he's there. And we're not working at the same time. Every day. Hey, I found this cool thing. You might try to do this hack. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is a, a, a feed that I want to do. It, it, also, we also allow, the, you saw the commenting for all the engagements. I'm going to bring, the, that'll help bring all those things out. So you'll say, hey, you know, I was doing this. What do you think about that? And we can go back and forth that way. Uh, so going back to the tooling vendors, when you go to, to, to a, a vendor, like if you go out to HP, not picking on HP per se, but because I just saw their, 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 their site, um, they, they very much want you to be in their ecosystem, right? Well, when you ask them, well, what, is your, what, is it, what does it look like? Well, if you use all of the, our products, we have this nice dashboard for you, and everything's just perfect. Well, if you're an HP shop, that's, that's fine. Um, but what if you want to include another tooling vendor, or what if you want to include something else? Then all of a sudden, you find yourself with like five dashboards, and none of those things talk to each other. Well, then they're like, well, you could get a SIM. Well, uh, okay, we've been down this road before, right? So each vendor views their stuff as their own thing, and when you ask them about dashboards, they're like, well, just use ours. Then the other part of it is, you look at their APIs, and you're like, how do I talk to that API? Well, this one's a REST-based API, which is cool. That's what we would prefer. Or this one's a SOAP. Or this is an XML-based. Oh, by the way, you have to have a credential. You have to go call a get login session. It's rather weird trying to talk to some of these tooling vendors. And then a very famous person once said, <laughs> this brought Matt, Matt, Matt and I were talking about this. We are like, he's like, could you just please first do it in the API? So the UI and the API match up, right? Super important, and, and, it, and it's still a big deal. Like if I look at any of the vendors, the last thing that they do is the API. Now I think in new versions of products, right, we want the API first and have the product use the API so that way you're using it the same thing and you don't have to develop separate tracks, right? That that's would be awesome. So now we want to look at the, the portion of, so we, we've got our intake form, we've got our bag of holding now. Um, and now we, we want to look at um, how do we actually make these processes work. So we looked at Rundeck, and Rundeck is cool, uh, but Stackstorm is, I think, even cooler. Uh, because it's Python, and I just like Python. Um, but the other reason, too, is it has webhooks. So you can set up uh, REST services as webhooks, and then those webhooks can act as a workflow agent. And you can do really, really cool things. Like you can post, you can create your own webhook that would say kick off a scanning job, that would kick off a reporting job, that would kick out an email to a developer, and then it would go do something else. So you can create these workflows that will work in your system. So you can have your you know, bag of holding, and then you can customize it with Stackstorm to do the custom workflow that you need. And then you can really um, then talk back into your, your bag of holding and post back all those events because that also has an API as well. So just some examples. Uh, here's one, you know, integrate your security tools and workflow. You could have a very generic, this is one thing I want to do, is create a very generic API. Um, because if you look at dynamic testing, right, there's a certain sort of thing that needs to happen. Um, you need a, you know, certain pieces of information to kick off a dynamic scan. Well, in the background then, you can say, well, what do I want to call? Do I want to call Zap? Do I want to call AppScan? Pick. Pick which one of those you want to call. Maybe you want to run them all. 
because maybe, as you know, so with certain tools, some tools do better uh, finding certain classes of vulnerabilities than others. And then when a certain tooling vendor either has too many false positives or things start to go south, you know, you can just yank it out of there and it really kind of puts you back into control with your program. You're not just beholden on a vendor to say, could you please fix this issue? Well, if they don't, just yank them and throw in another one and nobody really knows. It, it really is pushing the vendor back a little bit. Which I don't know if it will make vendors happy, but I don't care. So what you can do is you can unleash the, the, the horde of vendors, uh, uh, of scanners, right? So you can say, you know what, for that app, I want you to go scan it with these scanner, scanning tools and then pull it back into one source, which in this case we're pulling it back with ThreadFix, right? And, and then you can do some things, really cool things, like you can automate your false positives, right, to a, to a degree. So anything that finds it in a tool, so if you have three tools, right, and they find a vulnerability, and those three tools find it, the chances are that that vulnerability is probably correct, right? Now there's also the, the you could also get into a false negative situation, but, but what we're trying to do here is automate as much as we can, and we then can then point the, 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 uh, the, the people onto things that will matter more. So if I can give a developer say, hey, if you run our automated tooling suite, against your, our, your application, we're going to give you back true vulnerabilities. Now, we might not find them all, but what we give you will be actually true. Okay? And then we can come back later manually and see if there's actually other ones that do exist there. Because obviously, we all know uh, automation is only going to get you so far. So that's the idea there. Uh, some other things that you can do, uh, right? I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is like with, 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 your, with your assessment schedule, you can really have the tools start planning your whole roadmap out for the entire year. So based on what your security compliance policy is, maybe your compliance policy says for whatever reason, you must do an assessment of your application two or three times a year. Well, just set it up. Have, an app, have it set up in your, in your app to whenever it comes to around to a quarter or whatever it is, it automatically puts an engagement into your schedule. And so then you're always on top of everything, and it's not putting it puts you in a situation where, uh-oh, we haven't scanned this application for like a whole year, or we forgot about it, right? There's just, you can't, you, you, you're really letting the tool do what you want it to do. Some other um, things that we've talked about, these are things that we haven't done yet. These are kind of things that are on our roadmap of what we're interested in doing. Is like, and this isn't new to us, but a new idea from, that came from us, but we, we, we're thinking about is, you know, you watch a code branch, right? And then when you watch that code branch, decide on, well, what is the threshold of change that you are comfortable with? And then when it does, you can trigger a review. Or maybe there's that method for authentication or authorization. And that you know if, if that thing is touched, somebody has to go do a manual review. And so you use uh, Stackstorm to go and monitor your GitHub account. And as soon as that file changes, it's going to trigger out a manual engagement with a manual, uh, manual code review. And then you go back to the app team and say, hey, I saw you change that file. Uh, there's a little problem with this and such and such on line this. Would that be awesome, right? I, that, 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 so that's, a, that's the, what we're playing. You can see it's totally possible, right? And it, and it can absolutely scale. I mean, because who doesn't use some sort of source code repo that you can tie into? Yeah. Some things are easier to call out, some things are easier to call in. And it, it works either direction in terms of venting. Right. Right. And the other thing that we're gonna work we're gonna be working on is like as we do integrations for each of these, we're gonna be posting them to our um, public GitHub account. And then what we're hoping is that we'll start building up at least some sort of community around, you know, like with Stackstorm has all these plug-in modules. And so we're gonna contribute those back in and hopefully push some things out. Um, now, here's another thing that chat ops. Is anybody here doing chat ops? A few, right? Yeah. So I, when I originally heard of chat ops, I'll go back to uh, my fellow hipster friend. I thought that was only things that hipsters did, right? And, and I, like I said, I wasn't, I'm not a hipster. 
Um, but then I realized, you know what, it could actually be kind of useful. So when we were looking at uh, distributing tools, so we have a lot of command line tools that we've worked on. Matt's, Matt's contributed several of them. And we thought, well, we could give each one of the people those tools. Uh, or, or we can actually have that integrated into our HipChat, and we just call it through HipChat. Right, that makes sense. And then you don't have to distribute your tool. Nobody has to know what version it has. And then everybody in your organization, if you give them the permission to, can then execute those tools, right? Like why can't a developer go ahead and autom automatically add his, his uh, source code repo to a static code analysis tool? There's no reason, right? He could automatically say, hey, I want that, integrate it, here we go, let's do it. So um, we came up with this AppSec bot that we, that we, that we have based on uh, Willbot. Uh, it's just another Python um, built application. And so for example here, if we wanted to do a check mark scan, um, it, it's just check marks in the app name and the repository and it creates a check marks job. And so you just ask Will what it can do um, and it'll do it for you. And so we can keep iteratively adding to Will so that Will can do more and more things and really help the development team uh, automate their environment. Yeah, I have an example of that. Yeah, so. It's like I knew. <laughs> Very good lead-in. Yeah, I, I got you back. Yeah. We, we, we worked a lot on, on, on this together. Um, so yeah, so one of the ideas we had is, uh, can we have it give us advice about XSS? And so this is just our first cut at it. It's not perfect, but you know, any developer can go into our application security room, or they can go and ask the bot and say, hey, I need help on XSS. Uh, the other idea is that we can, um, you could put in advice XSS and you could say, well, what runtime language am I using? If I'm using PHP, I'll give you back some advice for PHP. Here's the supportive frameworks that we say to use for your uh, specific company. Uh, so th this is just the start of it. And then we're obviously, we push people back to our application security library uh, so that they can get more information. Thread fix. So for thread fix, um, we just call the app and it'll, It'll pull into ThreadFix, and it'll pull all the vulnerability stats from ThreadFix. So we're really trying to shine a light on vulnerabilities. For a long time, it's like, um, we don't want to tell people that we, our apps are vulnerable. Oh, come on. All of us have apps, and all of us have vulnerabilities. So let's tell people about it in a, in a way that makes sense. And so let's bring that to light. So this is what we're doing here with that. Uh, so we can do a whole lot of other things. We can create applications. We can get summary metrics. Um, and and we, we have a whole lot of other plans for, for our integration there. And what's nice about it is because it's Python, I mean, you, you come up with an idea, you think about it, you test it, and you just push it out there, and it's, it's deployment is really, really easy. Uh, here, so here's our check marks integration. I kind of got uh, carried away with them, these little emoticons, uh, just because. Uh, but anyway, I can create a check marks job here. You can see I'm creating it from the ICOM master repository, and here's where it is. And so what that does is it goes and creates the job in check marks, goes and creates it in thread fix, ties the two together. And uh, then the, the other part of it is it'll send a report to the developer. Done. Right? And then it'll automatically import that into thread fix. And that takes like two seconds. Right? So, so anything that we have to do, and I think Matt said this yesterday, anything that we have to do more than two times, we try and automate it. So... What my, what I would, what I, my takeaway for, for, for you guys would be this is, you know, let's make application security work. Let's be there where the developers are. Let's start an application security program where, where each, each developer can get access to what they need. Let's automate it like the same way that they're automating it. And let's just not sit around lamenting at the fact that, oh, you know, nobody cares about security or those kinds of things. Make it better. Right? You can start your own, if, if, the, if the tooling, tooling company isn't doing what you need to do, there's no reason why you can't do it on your own. There's no reason why you can't pull all these tools together and make it from that, that house of, you know, falling apart house to something that actually works for your company. I actually ended a little early. So, so uh, any questions on this?
so, so you said that you're going to open source the system. So from what moment on will it be open sourced? I'm hoping to get it open sourced in the next month. I have legal approval, so I just have a few more things. Legal was the biggest uh, hurdle. Awesome. So if you, I have my uh, contact information, and we'll tweet it out when it'll be available. And the, and the goal here, too, is right, you know, take it, make it yours. Or say, hey, you know what? What you wrote was not any good for us, but it gave us an idea. And, and really, that's what I'm trying to do is spark an idea to say, hey, look, we can make our application security program better. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, do you track the response time when you have come up with a report to one of your um, development teams and how fast they get back to you? And how do you speed that process up? So how do you sell to them that they should make this process faster, given that that is none of their KPIs, right? And then the second question, I'll ask after that. <laughs> so you're saying how long did it take for, for them to either fix? Uh, yeah. So, so we do have an SLA that we're working on. Uh, one of the things that we, you know, you talk about dumping a PDF report to them. Mm -hmm. That's usually not the way to go, right? No, so, I mean, you're dumping Jira tickets, right? Exactly. That's what at we're the doing. At same time, given that everyone tries to build at speed and build a minimal viable product, it might be it's not a it's, it's not that everything is broken, right? It might be a small vulnerability. It might be something right. that makes it better readable, better maintainable. Yeah, so we have SLAs tied to remediation plans. Um, and I can't say that it's perfect. In fact, it's probably far from perfect. But at least we have those SLAs built in. So if it's a critical, you know, we have to have it within a certain period of days. And then we can provide that reporting back to them. So they have a dashboard that they can log into and say, their management can say, hey, why, why is your security tech debt ratio so high? So it, two ways, right? Because now it's not just in our dashboard. It's also in their dashboard, and their management sees it. And that's where we start to see some things actually moving. And we could also send them nagging scripts, which we're not doing yet, but what we can do that. Yeah. But yeah, it's in, in the end, it's you're 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 fixing it by policy. Yeah. Um, the other question is, you mentioned that uh, developers are capable, or engineering managers, whatever, are capable of submitting things for review. And at the same time, you're tracking things that you haven't reviewed for a long time, where we use a similar um, way of going back into reviews of applications that we never get resubmitted, where they have metadata attached to their repository. And when that metadata gets updated or is critical, then we just review it more often. But I wonder how many of the, or which percentage of your reviews is actually those reviews that get submitted by developers themselves? And how did you get your developers to actually be so proactive? Yeah, so a uh, good question. Uh, so how do we get our developers to proactive? We have pockets of goodness <laughs> and pockets of uh, less goodness, I would say, if you want to say that way. So I have some teams that are pretty awesome about it. They're like, we know that we need security is important to us. And they'll come to us and they'll submit it. We, we also have others that say, go away, don't leave us alone. So I don't have any, uh, I don't know what made those people versus the other. Part of it's probably because we've worked with them for a while. They realize that we're not like here to hit them with a big stick. We're really trying to help them with their, so I think as, as we spend time with each one of them, they get better. Now it's not, I mean, you're always gonna find those teams that are very standoffish. I think it just depends a lot on the personality of the teams, if that helps. On an early slide, you mentioned um, keeping track of uh, security in the software development lifecycle. And you just mentioned a dashboard for developers. But the ball screen you sort of seem to be aimed at the application security team. Could developers use this to, say, track uh, code reviews that they do, security requirements type things, so that you can look at those sorts of activities as well? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think that w we could get there. Our product, obviously, is being minimal viable. <laughs> it was very much focused on us. We have looked at one. Some, there, there are some other tools out there that will give you the security requirements. But we, we have thought about it, and we've kind of roadmapped out what we want. And that is one of the things that we put as a feature list that we were like, why couldn't we do that? Really curious. 
curious to see what we get in terms of data after, say, a year of use. Because it's been all of three, four months. Yeah. yeah so there's not, you know, it's, it's very, very fresh. Um, I'm curious, do you allow developers or projects to come back for rescans in an automatic fashion? So maybe they could say, we want our code to be checked out every three weeks and scanned, and we want to know what the results are. So we do have an activity for retesting, a specific one. Um, we're still we're still working, like as as, as uh, Matt was saying, we're still working on our APIs to expose them. But we also have, you know, hooked them up so they are already integrated into you know statics. So they're doing static, and that's already integrated into their continuous delivery pipeline. So for example, in Jenkins, as soon as they submit it, we're checking it out, and it's getting a static scan. Uh, same with Dynamic, we're working on more automation around there. I, but you know, Dynamic and, and automating can be a little tricky, for sure. Um, but 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 the the goal would be, yeah, I don't see why we couldn't do that. Um, the only question is, would it overwhelm us? I, I have a suspicion it would. So we would have to get better about those automatic retests. And, and I think we're a little bit concerned to make sure that the automation that we do is fairly reliable in terms of no, no false positives. So that if we do let them just rescan themselves, we're giving them actionable results. I don't want them to rescan themselves and just get a whole load of false positives. So we're trying to find the right balance in terms of like a profile of the scan or what tools with what settings make sense. If we just haven't iterated enough on that. What's your experience in deploying this in a, in a, in a company? Do, do, do we have this kind of experience? Or? Yeah, so I mean, th this is what we did at Pearson, and that's what we're currently, we're, that's where we're road testing it on. It's live in the production. Yeah. yeah that, that's right, but how do people think about it? How do the developers, what are there? there? I would say I've gotten positive feedback because, for one, um, we went from not knowing how long it took us to actually do an engagement. So, you know, we had a spreadsheet and I look at that and go, uh, these guys submitted something like two, three months ago and we haven't done anything on it. And now we see the red aging thing right away. So it, it's helping us in our service quality, which is what I was really hoping for. And it also helps me to then say, hey, look, management, here's all the things that we're getting. I need more resourcing. Yeah, that's my point. I have to tell this to exactly. Yeah, no, and, and I think I, I've had positive feedback from our, from our team because it, because it actually helped us scale. You know, it, w it went from just being, you know, a couple guys that were doing some scans to an actual service offering. But I like the fact, too, like those ad hoc and then like, gee, what happened with our app library? Like, where is our app? You can ask the bump, you can ask the will, the bot, and find out in half a second, oh, you have this many guys and this many critical. So you can, you know, in essence, be on a call with them to have something on the keyboard and give them an answer. It's supposed to, gee, let me find that spreadsheet that's on the share. Yeah. The other cool thing we're working on now that I really like is uh, we're taking the vulnerabilities out of thread fix. I, I don't actually like doing reports, but some people want them. So for those, we're taking the vulnerabilities out of thread fix, and I can give you a status of your app right now. And the draft report is taking me 0.7 seconds to generate. So that's pretty cool. You know, I can hand up a draft report to you in 0.7 seconds. Now, it takes a human to actually tweak it and make it a little pretty. So maybe two hours, you have to report. Yeah, you can add templates. And exactly. And they're all consistent. Information or yeah. Particularly for our junior guys, they're all consistent. Like the layout and everything is all the same. Yes. Uh, could you give us a little more detail about the integration uh, of ThreadFix and, and Jira? It, does it go both ways? Uh, is it fully automatic? Because in the end, Jira is what the developers are going to be looking at. And you have to make really, really sure that what they see there is the, re the real thing. Right, so, so what we do right now is um, we go through and we review those vulnerabilities in ThreadFix, and then we submit them. There's a, you, know, you can submit them, and you can actually even aggregate them up. Um, and then we apply a little bit more detail to it, and, and this is going to be, and Dan's there, it's going to be improved. But then once you submit it, it goes directly into their backlog, and then once a day or whenever you set it up, we get back and say, hey, look, they've either done something to this or they decided not to action on it. Or as soon as it's fixed, then we get a notification back and we can do things about it. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else with that, Dan. And, um, another uh, user is, you know, send a pull request in um, to make your integration even better where you can set like, policies of like, how you want the most to be created as well as uh, templating uh, using velocity so that you can customize like, what information you want included. I have one final question, and then we're going to close up. 
Thanks for sharing this. I've been looking for something like this myself for a long time. Now, thanks for covering this as well. Sure. Um, I'm interested, uh, we t discussed briefly about the deduping and, and how you're doing that. Just, I know we can't talk details, but how much of an effort and what do you envision happening in terms of deduping if you have all the different tools and everything coming in, from yeah. different touch points feeding in? <coughs> how much of an effort? What are you thinking around the deduping that stuff and how well is it working for you? Yeah, so, I mean, with Redfix is doing a pretty good job with deduping, I would say. I mean, we haven't had any issues. So we can scan with, like, three different scanners, and then Threadfix is doing the heavy lifting for us and doing the dedupe part, which is really awesome. Yeah. A couple edge cases where there's... I mean, nothing's... Yeah. Something's dropped, but honestly, we've reported them to Threadfix, and they fixed them. Yeah. So, I mean, inevitably, like, we found a couple of wrinkles, but we've reported mm -hmm. bugs, and they've gotten fixed. So, you know, it's, it's, I've been pleased. And it's certainly better than anything I would have written myself in this short period of time. I'm not parsing god awful XML tool vendors, so I'm really happy. Thanks for being at the bleeding edge and helping Red Fix. <laughs> I don't mind sharing. There's more than enough work to go around. Yeah. So, with that, a big thank you and a big applause for Aaron and the other guys. When you leave the room, um, please don't forget.